It is fitting that we're going to take communion on this first Sunday of Advent. And here is a really an introduction to the receiving of communion. I want to invite you right now just to gear your mind in that direction. I want to encourage you, if you would care to do so, to grab one of these Advent devotionals that uh, were put out by our conference. I want to encourage you, don't forget, in the back, maybe think about January. Here's a 30-day devotional uh, by an author known all over the county, by, by me, and uh, countywide. So I sell dozens of those things, and uh, just make an offering to the church for that. I also want to encourage you, this is an article that I wrote uh, that's going to be a series of articles uh, in the Congregationalist magazine. I printed out a handful of just this article, and uh, they're on that table back there. I don't know, we need to call that table something, the wooden table in the narthex. And uh, so you can grab those, and I want to encourage you to take that. It has a lot of thoughts that are very consistent with what I'll be sharing all through Advent today included. That is, that the incarnation... The sacramental way, that's what this is. This is like the sacramental way, the sacramental method, one author called it. Gaius Glenn Adkins, the pastor at First Congregational Church in Detroit, called it that, in fact. And another author I found called it something very similar in the early 1900s. The sacramental method, that is the way that God imparts himself to us sacramentally. You know, what does that mean? You can dive through scores and uh, number, hundreds of, of theological texts and try to figure out what exactly the incarnation is and surely then try to figure out exactly how it applies to the sacrament. What does that mean? You have understandings ranging all the way from that really is about to become the body and blood of Jesus, metaphysically, all the way to it's just a little celebration. Neither of those things, I think, are entirely accurate. I think it's more than a simple celebration. That's not just juice, but it becomes so by way of the Holy Spirit interacting with us. Not interacting with that, the elements. The sacrament of communion is a reflection of the incarnation of Jesus into flesh to die on our behalf, a substitutionary atonement, where he took a penalty for our sin, the penalty for our sin, to make a way for freedom. That's the classic view. I affirm that. I think the scripture affirms that. It's also where Jesus paid a ransom to set us free from our new master. That's the Christus Victor view of the incarnation and the crucifixion. I think scripture speaks to that. Horace Bushnell, a well-known congregational pastor, a couple of centuries ago, he said that on the cross when Jesus was dying and hanging on that tree, that it was God showing us just how much he loved us and also how we ought to live in this world. Certainly that's, that's called the moral influence theory. I don't think that does enough, but it certainly informs us. The sacramental method, that is, God putting himself into physical elements, it informs our living in this world. That's what this article is all about, where two or three are gathered. It's Matthew 18, 20, by the way. I don't know if that was me or the editor that messed that up. No, it's not Matthew 18, 12. That says something altogether different. Matthew 18, 20 talks about wherever two or three or more are gathered in my name, there I'm in the midst of them. So what does that mean? Two or three or more gathered here today, so Jesus is in our midst. So you and I have become a kind of incarnation of the presence of God in the world. So that those hands are his hands. Someone posted a little thing on a social media website this morning that I noticed that said, if you want to put the Christ back in Christmas, start by acts of service and love and kindness and compassion during the Christmas season. I said, amen. Absolutely. Be the incarnation. That's how we honor Jesus for what has happened at Christmas. The ground of religion is in the changeless love of God. And what is true religion? 
If not that which is found in James 127, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Pure religion that is consistent with the scripture and with what God is doing in the world inside of me and you is living incarnationally. That's what Emmanuel means. Emmanuel. God with us. That's one of the many names of Jesus. God with us. His name Jesus comes from us retranslating his name in Hebrew into a bunch of different languages, finally arriving in English as Jesus. There's no J sound in Hebrew. His mother would have called him something more like Yeshua, which comes from the root word Yasha, which means saved. Yeshua. God saves. Emmanuel, God is with us. By way of comprehending what God is doing in the sacrament of communion, you and I can comprehend what God is doing in the world, and you and I can begin to be a part of what God is doing in us, through us, in, in this world. I want to share with you just two thoughts, and then we're going to take communion. In Christ, God has crashed into our experience, bringing eternal divinity into our natural reality. That's not high and lofty. Listen, in Jesus, God said, I care about what you're going through. God is with us. In Jesus, we see the perfect reflection of the character of God. Jesus says to his disciples, have I not been with you so long, you still don't figure this out? If you see me, you see the Father. I and the Father are one. Jesus is not a representation of God. He is God. <laughs> Stop distracting me. Candle lighter thing. Acolyte thing. There are essentially two aspects of the incarnation of Emmanuel. God is with us in Christ to save us, and God is with us in Christ to change us, or to sanctify us, to set us apart for his, his use. So what has he done for us? Hear this. In Jesus, God has made a way for salvation for all sinners to be forgiven of their sin. Look beyond the lights. In Jesus, God has made a way for all sinners to be forgiven of their sin. That's what penal substitution is all about. He was born, he went to a cross to suffer on our behalf, to set us free, to pay the penalty of our sin. It's in some sense a kind of a legal thing. God, who is righteous and holy and just, couldn't just look beyond our sin, but he not only could he not look beyond it, he couldn't handle the thought of losing us. So he made a way. And that way is Emmanuel, God with us. He said, you know what, I'm going to go in. He didn't come as a mitre warrior with an army to break us out of prison. That's one way God could have done it. He didn't set us free from the enslavement we had put ourselves into our enemy by way of our sin. He didn't come and just defeat the enemy militarily and then set us free, break us out of the prison, a jailbreak. He didn't do that, but he could have done that. He didn't come as a liberator in the classical sense of one with a key to the gate from the outside to open it and let us in. No, it's more like this. You and I were lost, imprisoned to our sin, in shackles, enslaved, and one day we looked up and a fellow prisoner's name was Yeshua. God saves. He didn't come and set us free from the outside. We looked up and there was Emmanuel. God was with us. He suffered like us, the Bible says. He endured like us. He endured all things like us. 
The sacramental life is that God came into human flesh and took on our pain to set us free. And the sacramental life, if you and I declare ourselves to be followers of Jesus Christ, has a lot less to do with what the heck exactly is happening with those elements and more to do with what the heck is happening with these elements. That bread represents the body of Jesus Christ. Guess what? This hand and your hand is the body of Jesus Christ in this world. It's, 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 not, it's not just there for us. We become one with Christ and then we are there as the incarnational representation of God in Christ in the world. So that when one shakes our hand, they shake the hand of Jesus. If God has set us free in Jesus, the very next moment, it's no longer about us. It's about us becoming more like him so that we can share him with the world around us. No, he didn't come and set us free from the outside. Emmanuel, God with us. He lived and suffered like us so that we might be set free. And now you and I are called to live and suffer like the rest of the world so that they might find freedom in Jesus Christ by way of their connection to us. You know, I, I have this little, little communion set in my office I don't use the things nearly as often as I should have, or as I should. You know, it's a, a little like travel kit. Have you ever seen those? A little travel kit? Maybe, I haven't here, but maybe uh, some pastor has showed up at your bedside with a little travel when you're sick. That's a bad sign. That usually means the pastor thinks you're about to go up there, by the way. And uh, so he's like, we're going to let's just handle this communion thing. And um, no, that's not really true. Not usually. And uh, so at any rate, have you ever seen one of those things? A little travel communion set, right? It's cool. It's got little cups and everything. And you take communion to somebody. You and I are walking communion travel sets. And we're supposed to be taking the body and blood of Jesus with us everywhere we go. We've got to stop thinking about the sacramental life in terms of, you know, it's brass and it's just so and it's, you know, we've got to stop thinking like that. The sacramental life is a way of being the incarnation of God in the world. So that those other prisoners to sin can look up and say, oh, there's Emmanuel. Oh, wait a minute. God's with me. You're different. You're not the same. Who made you that way? Oh, Jesus. So what has God done for us in Christ? He's made a way that we can be set free from sin. And here's just one other thought, and then we'll move directly that way, because I promised myself that we'd be out before one this afternoon. <laughs> before noon is what I promised myself. Before 11.43. <clears throat> what about what Christ is presently doing in us? I've been really wrestling with this, how to say this thought that's swirling around in my mind, and I still don't know if I'll say it well, but I'm praying that God will use the actual practice of communion to make it make sense. We have union with God through faith in the Son and are filled by the Holy Spirit, but many have union but don't experience communion, not meaningfully anyway. There are a lot of us who believe all that I've just said. Yeah, I'm free in Jesus. I place my trust in him. I'm, I have union with God. I'm, I'm set free from the consequence of sin. Okay, I get that. But now on a daily, regular basis, you're just not sensing a direct connection to God in Christ. It's not meaningful. It doesn't seem existential there's that word again it doesn't seem experiential you know it's like sometimes God's far off I don't sense him in here anymore I, I don't feel a connection I want to suggest to you today that as we participate in the sacrament of communion that perhaps perhaps it's because we've made an idol of the sacramental life instead of a personal present reality I want to suggest that it's because too often we've stopped at union. Okay, I've forgiven, I've prayed, I've received Christ. Now we've stopped there. 
In our front yard, I noticed the other day, it seems striking to me and it seems almost inappropriate somehow. In our front yard, I put up some Christmas lights and uh, then the neighbor put his up and clearly he's trying to win. I told him the other day, clearly you're trying to win this competition, brother. But I don't have the money this year for the electric bill, so you get off easy this year. Next year, we'll come back at it. Well, I've got some Christmas lights out there, and there's, you know, some little presents, and the, I found one that opens and shuts. It's cool. Got it on, got it on sale. I was happy about that. And uh, I was super happy about that. And uh, got some lights up, got some stuff shooting on the house. And then right in the middle of it, Sebastian, who was helping me that night, took a cross, that this light-up cross, and hung it right in the middle of all the lights. And there's a part of me that whenever I see that, I'm like, man, are we just supposed to be celebrating the birth? Can we wait till Easter for that Good Friday? No. No, because he came for that, to set us free. He, he came, Emmanuel, God is with us. What's he with us in? In our pain, in our trial, in our suffering, in our sin, to set us free. He came not just to set us free from sin, but to separate us from it and put us with God. That's a big deal. He didn't just come to, to, to set us free to say, here's your pardon. He came to say, not only are you pardoned, but here, you're with us. You're with me. He, he came not just to free us from the consequences of sin, but to begin to separate us from it. To pull us away from it, the way you have to pull gum from a shoe takes time and here's the last thought that I would leave you with as we receive communion may it be more than a ritual or an idolatrous action to celebrate the beauty of that brass or even the reality of him setting us free and then stopping there okay I'm free that's it he came to separate us to use us And I would suggest to you today that if you are aware of your union with God, but not sensing communion with God, like real interaction, the presence of the Holy Spirit, maybe it's because we've not been fully separated unto service. I've said it this way a thousand times. I don't know if if it makes much sense. It does to me. It made more sense in the South, to be honest with you. There's parts of Virginia and North Carolina where you drive through the countryside and with some frequency you'll see an engine hanging in a tree. They'll be making fun of it. I know we got rednecks in Michigan too. (laughs) So don't laugh too hard. An engine was made to power a vehicle. And unless you are a fool, you don't keep filling an engine with gas that's hanging in a tree. Likewise, the Lord refuels those followers of Jesus who are following Jesus. And it's in the refueling that the direct sense of communion with God comes. In other words, the more we allow ourselves to be used by God, the more he'll fill us so that we can experience his love to share it with others. Something about my cup running over comes to mind. A little drop in the bottom of the cup after a week is not good to drink. If you question that, come to my house where my kids routinely leave little drops of cups in their bedrooms. You don't want to drink it a week later, especially if it was chocolate milk. It's no longer chocolate milk. Listen, the freshness, the purity comes in being filled every day. I'm spilling it out. I'm spilling it out. I hope that God will use some of that. This morning as we receive the sacrament of communion, I want to encourage you to get well beyond the ritual of it. By way of direct contemplation of the meaning of it, like the Apostle Paul said, don't drink this cup if you're not ready to drink it right. And drinking it right is knowing how desperate our need for his grace is. Let's celebrate what God has done in Christ and what he's doing in us today.